Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank MAPS. It's really an honor to be here at MAPS. I get credit towards my medical license for doing this, which is really a, a gift. And uh, I want to thank Bia. I don't know if she's here, but I really want to thank her for including me and thank people from my ayahuasca community that are here. I have uh, a lot I would like to say. I have 30 minutes. I'm going to probably bleed into the question time, you know. 20 minutes exactly, so I'm going I'm to bleed into the question time, but I'm going to do my best. There's some things I want to say, uh, so this is my talk. First, quickly, you know, peyote medicine is how I got my start. I've got friends at the Peyote Way Church of God. They were going to be here. They couldn't be here. Maybe one day we'll have a peyote track at MAPS. That would be nice yes. in the United States of America. Yes. So, you know, I'm going to kind of explore, you know, the, the developing role of traditional spiritual medicine, not just ayahuasca, in modern society from the perspective of myself as a doctor. What's driving ayahuasca medical tourism? I'm not talking about just psychonautics and explorers, but there are a lot of people who are going down there for health care, and that's what we see primarily at our center. And why do they come? What aren't they getting from the healthcare system here? What are we providing at centers like Niwerao? And uh, what might be the role of our medicine and other traditional spiritual medicines in the, in the future of healthcare? I also promised Anderson D. Bernardi I would plug him. This is uh, his artwork and his website. Check it out. Um, this is my background. She went over it. So uh, I had this great video with Icaros in there talking about how uh, for the last few years I am training under Ricardo Amaringo and Shipibo Shamanism. And you know, trying to fit this talk, I got back from the Amazon on Sunday we're working very hard there for the people there, running four ceremonies per week, and uh, I'm assisting in that, you know, for over half the year with my prior background, and uh, this is what I've come up with. Too bad, it was a really cool video montage. It doesn't work on the system. Um, this is my main message, since I have this anxiety that I will not be able to get my message across. <laughs> I'm just giving you the punchline, and then we'll race towards the question, period. And uh, so it's a little technical, but I'm going to try to explain it. Traditional ayahuasca ceremony offers an opportunity for rapid, rapid limbic revision, resulting in profound healing, likely in part through epigenetic revision in the limbic system and related structures and beyond. Traditional cultural technologies are particularly well suited to address our limbic system, which is largely subconscious. This has great implications for repairing limbic dysfunction and related psychoneuroimmunologic dysfunction. So then I say psychedelic treatment with proper set and setting, which integrates things like tribal and shamanic ceremonial concepts like the MDMA assisted psychotherapy may work through similar mechanisms. So here we go, the race begins. First, this is our center. We are, uh, that's our website. Please come visit us. Niwe Rao Centro Espiritual, traditional Amazonian healing center founded in 2011. We practice traditional Shipibo uh, medicine, plant medicine, shamanic medicine. The Shipibo people are of the Ucayali region of uh, Peru, not from Iquitos. They come to Iquitos for the tourism to treat people from uh, all over the world. And one day people eventually will go to Pucallpa. Um, we heal through plant medicine, through traditional Shipibo diets with master plants, which Stephen touched on. And uh, we are specialists in traditional ayahuasca ceremony. This is Iquitos here in Peru. Pucallpa is there in the middle. That's, uh, that's the Amazon. So we're in our third year as a healing center. Um, we've treated a few hundred people now, and so I'm trying to share my perspective as a doctor watching this whole process. These are my partners. Uh, this is Ricardo Amaringo. He's a master people healer with extensive experience. He is guiding all the treatment at our center, uh, and he is the majority owner of our center. We are a Shipibo run center with Gringo Associates. This is our other partner, Svita Mamek. She is a Canadian artist and also an up-and-coming healer. And we do a lot of integrative things. There's an art maloka, there's art therapy. We have other healers come through, body workers, yoga, uh, energy healing, acupuncture. We're very open to, uh, to moving forward into integration. So like I said, here's me and Ricardo back in the day when Ricardo had long hair. It's a traditional treatment that we offer with Western integration under the guidance of a, a Shipibo master. So when you come to our center, the typical treatment course, just to give you an idea, you're going to show up, you're going to take a vomitive on arrival, throw up, then you're going to review your intentions of why you're there uh, with the shamans. What can we do for you? How can we help you? Then you're going to be assigned a master plan, which you are just going to, then you're going to be on a diet, a vegetalista diet, kind of uh, along the lines of what Stephen described. 
a little more strict in the Shipibo tradition under Ricardo. You may be in isolation, that's a possibility. There's also going to be additional plant treatments involved. Topical plant treatments, possibly plant vapor steam baths, possibly plant baths. And so ayahuasca in the traditional indigenous, you know, as people keep touching on this topic, is part of a larger traditional Amazonian plant medicine system, like traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurveda, etc. Ayahuasca is one of the pieces of that story. So we practice, you know, with the diet, with the master plants, with all these other elements. And yes, we do do ayahuasca ceremony, and that happens four nights a week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. During those ceremonies, you are going to be treated uh, by the Icaros, mystical healing songs, which is integral to our treatment. Uh, in this tradition, as opposed to some other traditions, the patient is not obligated to drink ayahuasca. And so the shaman drinks ayahuasca to make connection with the spirits and the plants and then sings to the patient. And the patient is coming to receive healing song. We do offer ayahuasca to our patients, but it is not a requirement of experiencing our ceremony. And then we do a lot of post-ceremony uh, conversation and counseling. There is a lot of dialogue. That's what we, we promote. We are into dialogue and integration through dialogue. A lot of people have the idea that uh, the indigenous community is not into talking. That's due to a language barrier. That's why, you, that's why people think that. Uh, the Shipibos, I live with them, I work with them, they talk all the time, uh, including during ceremony. And uh, so then you're going to continue your diet and you go through your process until it closes. That might be days, that might be weeks, it can be months, and we do offer a one-year diet as well. This is uh, Ricardo works in ceremony with two to three shamans, always. We have two to three, this is our other shaman that's a staple right now, Estela Pangosa Sanakai. And uh, we're also working with Ricardo's uncle-in-law, Oscar uh, Peña Vasquez. Ricardo believes in a lot of discussion and understanding. Here's him giving a lecture, teaching an Icaro uh, to a group of people in the Maloca. So back to the questions. What is driving ayahuasca medical tourism, the healthcare-driven side, like I said? And, you know, well, pretty clearly it's the problems that are now responding well to our typical uh, healthcare approach. So this is kind of a little overview of the family of problems that we see a lot at our center. This is the kind of problems people are coming for and the kind of problems that people are hearing about word of mouth from our patients that this is how they got help. So then we keep getting more of this kind of thing. So emotional, psychological trauma is a core and central issue uh, that we deal with. So then you have a lot of associated things, anxiety, depression, PTSD, addiction, autoimmune disease, which at least in part is related to uh, some psychosomatic components, and then psychosomatic illness, things like chronic fatigue, chronic cough, post-infectious immune dysfunction, you know, somebody who had mononucleosis, we just treated somebody last week. So we're not treating the edgy, the blah, 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 we just treated a Norwegian family, very conservative family, the dad is not into any kind of psychedelics, they've never done anything. Their daughter is a national karate team member who had a all this malaise and fatigue after mono that she suffered last year, and the doctors can't help her. There's nothing, you know, to do. I'm a doctor, I know. We wouldn't we just kind of shine them on and say, you know, you're going to get better. And that's where she's at. And they're wealthy. They've been to all this stuff. She's going to compete again, you know. She was with us a couple weeks. She's ready to go back. She's ready to compete. So how are we able to make progress with these cases through, you know, these so-called primitive techniques? And what do these cases share with each other from a Western perspective? Do they share some common physiology? And, uh, and so I get asked a lot, you know, how do you make sense of it, Joe, uh, as a doctor and academic experience in that world? And then you're in there in ayahuasca ceremony all the time and we do with the shamans. How do you compute, you know? Doesn't it make you crazy? And, and no, it doesn't at all. And I think the easiest way to make sense of, you know, to integrate philosophies is around some purpose. And so the patient tells the story of integration, you know? If somebody wants to understand what happens, how do you mix it? Well, somebody showed up. The doctor said this is what's wrong with them. They said they had this, uh, you know, mono problem, this fatigue. She came to us. The shaman said this. We went through a treatment course. This is what the shaman described. This is what me as the doctor observed. This is what the patient described happened to them. And you come out at the other end, and you also review the three perspectives. And if there's a healing, then we have something to talk about. You know, we have a story to explore. So to explore one story is a, a 32-year-old female who came to us with a long-term history of depression and really struggling with low back pain and knee pain associated with like some, you know, some serious obesity that she had fallen into. But she's only 32 and now she's having serious mobility problems. She can't walk around, she can't participate in life. 
And so she's really kind of retreating. She came to us and, uh, for one month, you know, so our treatments can get quite extensive and some people do make really big progress in one week and two weeks and ten days and other people, you know, we, we request at least a month and some people need a lot more than that. So she, di- she came and dieted one month with us and had ayahuasca ceremony. In that process of dieting, she of course lost weight and, and uh, she went home and decided to keep dieting for three months. And then she wanted to come back for another month to finish. So she did that. So, like I said, yes, she, in the discipline and the removal from her social situations, she was able to organize her life and get physically healthier, but there was a lot of emotional healing that happened in the process and a lot of things that came to the surface. Beyond the uh, abuse and things that she had suffered verbally, physically, she realized that she had been molested by her father, and uh, she was able then spiritually to resolve that issue in ceremony and move forward, and now she is flourishing. So she, uh, you know, this prolonged cleanse likely had many implications. It's really hard from a scientific perspective to try to pick apart what exactly it was. But she saw dramatic improvements in all aspects of her health. And at the end of her treatment, she handed me this book. And she said, Joe, this is what you guys did for me. They explain everything right here. You healed my limbic system. And this is this book, General Theory of Love, which I think is like pivotal in this work pivotal in our understanding. I think it's a breakthrough genius work and I think it's fantastic. And this UCSF psychiatrist put this book together, Thomas Lewis and his colleagues. I don't know if anyone knows them. I would love to meet them. I would love to invite them to our center. Um, So they talk about a lot of things. So one of the things they talk about is the limbic system. How's my time? Where are we at? Just to Um, get serious here. uh, You have like seven minutes. Seven minutes. Okay, we'll keep going. The limbic system. So, you know, It's our emotional system, basically, and it's open loop, as it turns out. It's regulated by our relationships to other people, okay? That's the thing about our limbic system. So we learn to regulate our emotions through subconscious interaction with, initially, our parents through emotional cues, through facial recognition, through the voice, through the eyes, through all these things. We don't even have to think about it. This is an instinct of human beings, a subconscious thing that happens to us, and it's a window of development during childhood that's particularly important. And then there are other areas in life, severe emotional trauma can also make an impact and imprint the system. Problems in this process, for example, in the childhood development stage, result in long-term emotional difficulties and difficulties coping with stress. This is very well documented. The limbic system, just to describe a few elements, is linked to, for example, episodic autobiographical memory associated with the sense of the self in the past, a mental reliving of an experience, emotional processing, social processing, dreams, sexuality. I went, wow, this sounds like an ayahuasca ceremony, you know? This sounds really familiar. So here's the limbic system. The idea is you have this reptilian system, the fight or flight survival territorial system at the base of your brain. Then over that is the limbic system, which we share with mammals, which is pivotal in our social relationships. And then the neocortex, which is our thinking brain, the human brain, which is more evolved in us and separates us from, from the other mammals. So they bring up these three concepts. First, limbic resonance is the capacity for sharing deep emotional states arising. So what it is is emotional emotional attunement. So two people, I can look with you, I can connect with you, boom, I know his emotional state, he knows mine. It's a natural process. Next step, limbic regulation. So as you resonate with someone over time, that has a subconscious effect on your system, and that is what happens to the child with the mom. They say some, some problem, oh, they look at the mom, what should I do? The mom's calm, oh, okay, we calm down. The mom's scared, oh, I want to stay scared. So we do that with each other all the time. I see somebody crying, I look at them, oh, maybe my eyes water. I hear laughter, oh, maybe I'm going to laugh. You know, this is an open loop system that we have, and it's been overlooked. So there's limbic regulation, subconsciously, you know, uh, we have these subconscious imprints on our personalities and moods, affecting our future lives, our choices in relationships, perhaps our desire for a substance to regulate our emotions. And then there's this process of limbic revision, which is the therapeutic alteration of the limbic system. So they give the example, they're psychotherapists. So they say you can do in psychotherapy, you limbically resonate with your patient. Over time, you know, you get this regulation and eventually you revise them. It's a subconscious process. They say it really doesn't matter what you talk about. That's what it is. Okay. So the issue is that the psychotherapeutic model takes like three to five years. That's what they recommend. So this 32-year-old female with this, our approach, felt like she was able to get to that place much faster. 
you know, and there were two months of her treatment that were focused on ayahuasca. So her limbic function improved, as she understood it, more emotional stability, improved habits and relationships, improved stress coping, etc. People primarily come to us for emotional healing, I say limbic revision, which is then treated through a larger spiritual approach and context. So psychotherapy, I'm saying, you know, is working through the same kind of thing, limbic revision. For me, in many cases, anecdotally speaking, traditional approaches include the ritual use of ayahuasca it can be much faster. So here's Ricardo chilling in the Maloca. So I say that also, I think this is happening through epigenetic processes, and I'm going to try to squeeze that in. Quick thought on integral psychology, you know, Ken Wilber and spiral dynamics, talking about stages of development. And let's say we talk about physics, and then we go to the biology phase. Biology includes physics. We don't need to forget about physics because we're talking about biology, and so on. So then we have these other stages of development that they link up in spiral dynamics and integral psychology, and check it out, I don't have time to get into it. But for instance, the, the development of the brain, the reptilian brain, the limbic brain, to the neocortical brain and all those stages, they've correlated it to all kinds of things. And one of the things they correlated to was stages of development of the society. So they're saying that the tribal shamanic stage of society is actually very closely correlated to that limbic world. It's about uh, emotion, social community, feeling. And we've kind of like bypassed. We see this photo of Celestina, a shaman that visited us. A lot of people would say, oh, this is National Geographic. I don't have anything to do with that. Who is that character? It's like, no, all of us are from tribal roots, all of us. And we have walked away and forgotten and turned our back on, on all people all over the world, pretending like we have nothing to do with them. And it's that lack of integration of that limbic phase of our humanity that was a big part of why we're suffering today. So we are in this neocortical brain phase, ego, individuality, scientific achievement, and technology. So we're trying to apply methods from that world onto this limbic world, and it's not that effective. And that's why they end up coming down to Peru. So now I say it's time for our culture to integrate all this stuff. You know, we've got a French guy doing a year diet training to be a shaman at our center, and then the burners over at Burning Man doing what they're doing, reliving the tribe. So I'm saying this family of problems, for our perspective, from a shamanic perspective, is kind of a spiritual illness perspective. And I'm saying that that is manifested in limbic dysfunction. What do the shamans say is wrong? They say this person has accumulated too many dark energies, dark spirits, and that's what they're coming for is cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. Uh, so if we don't treat and clean these energies, the person gets sick. So what do we do? This is our maloka. We clean, we clean, we clean. So there is similar uh, ideas throughout all the traditional cultures, actually. Here I am with a Zulu Sangoma in South Africa recently. They do ritual bathing, plant baths, vapor treatments. They're all about ritual cleansing and cleaning, that that is a key to health. Do we have anything that parallels that in Western science? It turns out, yes, we do. In the psychoneurological world, we have this concept of allostatic burden and load. So it's basically that our stress response system, which is very well defined and described at this stage by psychoneurology, is burdened over time by accumulated stress, modified and sometimes overburdened, sometimes maladaptive. I'm going fast because I gotta go fast. So they have conditions, this is the kind of things, just multiple stresses. You ha how do you measure allostatic load? They have a measurement. This cortisol levels, uh, adrenaline levels, inflammatory markers, these are all links of the, of the immune system being overburdened by accumulated stress that's sitting and, and weighing on the system. PTSD, great example, okay, of an overburdened stress response system. Pretty clear. This is Russ. He came to, uh, down to the center a while back, treated, got better. From the shamanic perspective, cleaning all the energies and the spirits of the war, that's what we did. So migraine, you know, is looked at as a maladaptive response to stress, injury to the stress coping mechanism. Again, chronic fatigue syndrome and highest allostatic load. You know, here we see it taking shape and all these illnesses that kind of look kind of spiritual. Um, this... Childhood, you know, kids that will have their, their parents die. Here's all the measurements. Their HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary uh, adrenal axis stress response system is marked, okay? Uh, Psychoneurology is a study of all this. Here's the brain. It's all very well described. This is the autonomic nervous system, very well described, connected to the whole thing, connected to digestion, connected to erectile dysfunction and all these other emotionally related problems that are so everywhere, uh, connected to our emotions very directly. Uh, an expression of our subconscious body controlling our tears, our laughter, our digestion, our upset stomach, our nausea, our vomiting, our diarrhea. Sounds like an ayahuasca ceremony. <laughs> Here's the limbic system again. There's the hypothalamus sitting in the middle, heading up the stress response system in the HP axis. And if you go to these other talks, the psilocybin, there's a hypothalamus. There's other people, there it is. 
So accumulated energy, stress from childhood, maltreatment, psychological trauma, leads to increased allostatic load. Allostatic load represents maladaptive functioning in our psychoneuromyologic apparatus. Leaves us with less capacity, capacity to cope with stress, et cetera, et cetera. So then it's like a stress response system for us. Ayahuasca in a proper ritual setting in Ikaros can be effective in cleaning accumulated stress damage, allostatic load burden, often resulting from emotional trauma. Epigenetics, I just want to touch on this. Epigenetics, the coding of the genes, okay? This is the coding of the genes, not the genes themselves. Very susceptible to lifestyle, nutrition, environmental toxicity, toxicity, psychosocial stress. So now we see, and this is what gets imprinted. Here's them. Oh, it looks like, where, where is the imprinting happening during maternal imprinting, childhood trauma? Oh, it looks like it's the epigenetics, you know? Attachment theory, these neglected monkeys, what's wrong with them? It's their epigenetics. You know, early life adversity associated with the broad scope of lifelong and health and behavioral disorders. The study examines whether randomized, blah, blah, blah. It's basically epigenetics, okay? That's what I want to tell you. There's, it's a growing thing. Epigenetic mechanism of depression and antidepressant action. So I think we should explore the possibility that we at the Ayahuasca Healing Centers are cleaning allostatic load, pathologically imprinted epigenetics from our emotional centers, which, by the way, are hardwired into our tears and our, via, our vomit. Rapid limbic revision. That's what I want to say. And the last thing I just want to say is Spiritual health, you know, where the rubber hits the road in embodied consciousness, you know, is the emotional health is there. And so we see that. And so, I'm not, we, you know, Jack Mabit is going to get much more into the spiritual technologies, as other people have talked about, or what we do in shamanism and in technology. But in a way that the larger community is going to understand, emotional health is a place where that's marked. And our limbic system is there, and the epigenetic imprinting of the limbic system is there. So I think this should be a focus of some research. It's, it's, it seems interesting to me. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank we you. do have time for a couple of questions. Right. So if you have a question, please come up to the microphone in the center of the aisle. Thanks, Joe. That's a wonderful presentation. Um, I see you mentioned, I uh, get the pronunciation right, icon spondylitis. The first word is? Ankylosing spondylitis. Yeah. Um, that results in quite a uh, severe deformation of uh, maybe the upper vertebra. Um, in the treatment you guys have done, have you seen any reversion back to normal state with uh, that condition? Yeah, no, I mean, our experience with that condition was one individual who was suffering a great deal for most of his life, and so we don't have long-term results or further x-ray results, but he did have a great alleviation of the symptoms and ability to return to a lot of functioning. And it was done primarily through cleansing in the Maloka, hardcore shamanic cleansing, and a lot of emotional trauma cleansing that contributed to the improvement of what is an underlying, has genetic tendencies towards that, but these other factors are undoubtedly related to the progression of the disease. Yeah? Is that? Okay. Hi, uh, that was a great presentation, I have to say, and very rapid, I was impressed. And I'm really excited that your center is largely owned by Shipibo. I spent a fair amount of time in the Amazon. I have to say, sadly, that is not usually how it goes. And my question, um, as someone who spent a lot of time in the Maloka, but uh, I often wonder to what extent people with a medical or scientific background believe that the tools and the analysis that they have available to them is adequate to describe these types of experiences. And since you seem to run the both worlds, I'm very curious about your yeah. perception on that. Yeah, it's not adequate. I mean, you have, to, you have to integrate philosophies to describe both. You know, the both phenomena are there. Neither model can fully describe what's going on. So from a shamanic perspective, you know, all kinds of other stuff is going on, psychological stuff. So the physiologic stuff, the embodied consciousness, as I would say, has, uh, there's, you can see marks of this other thing. You know, they're related, right? That's what this whole conference is about. They're saying, well, if we take these hallucinogens and then we have spiritual experiences, so somehow in the flesh those molecules are related to this spiritual machinery. So we have something inside. So it's not adequate, but it's important. So if we can show that like going through some treatment course with singing and shamanism and exorcisms and all the rest of it ends up 
with lowering cortisol levels, normalizing adrenaline levels, changing inflammatory markers, that's very important because that's something that everyone can relate to. And now that's my point is that if we have this family of illness, which I'm you know, trying to say this limbic problem that's so widespread because of the ignorance of our society, uh, it needs to be addressed. And so this PTSD is a classic issue, you know, so they're trying to do it with, with MDMA-assisted uh, psychotherapy, and it's fantastic, and they're getting great results. So if we're getting great results with these problems, and if the technologies that we have are not adequate to help these problems, then we're holding back valuable health care to people that could use it, that are suffering. And so that's my point, like, that's what I want to make a point of. It's like, this is a policy moment, you know, we're, we're misguided in this area, and we're hurting because of it, you know. And the proof is, and all these people that are coming down, and they're getting some rapid results. You know, most of our people are getting, you know, a lot of improvement. And there's people here that bring people to our center and let them tell you, you know, don't hear it from me. But we're helping people. And a lot of people down there are helping people. Yeah, there's some witchcraft and all the rest of it. But there are healers. You know, there are healers. There's, it's nothing worse than this. Some witch doing something is nothing compared to drone bombing Pakistan. You know, you want to, this is the evil empire, man. Everyone wants to tell these guys for causing a little diarrhea and some nightmares, you know. I don't know. But Joe, I want to ask you a question, and I just, I came in a little bit late on your lecture, and I've talked to you a lot. What can we do to change the dialogue in Western science, because we both do science, we both do, to where the model is more receptive to a larger paradigm that's more perceptually friendly to a lot of phenomena that has occurred for 50,000 years plus that now is being abnegated as being not existing, and when we both know that it does exist. I would say, like, my first vote, my first move is to look at a system, namely the psycho neuroimmunologic system, use that as a guide. The first problem in medicine is this organ systems that are breaking up the whole body, and you see the kidney doctor, and if it's not a kidney problem, who cares? And that's kind of how it's working right now. So then that model has actually come up with the system, psycho neuroimmunology, the brain connected to the nerves, connected to the immune system, connected to the endocrine system, that breaks down all those walls. And all the molecules that were supposed to be neurotransmitters are also hormones, as it turns out, and they're also cytokines of the immune system. So I would say that is a system that goes across a lot of barriers in the model. And so, and it goes, it touches these other areas, spiritual areas and stress-related areas. So for me, that's one area to, to focus on in medicine that's going to help us talk to these larger themes. Well, in terms of uh, autoimmune diseases, which you know quite a bit about, that they have a uh, kind of adipothic um, pathology to them, and no one has really been able to really understand that. So it's, in my opinion, you know, there's a science component to this uh, conference. There needs to be medical practitioners like yourself that's willing to open up to other possibilities that we can talk about certain neoplasias that may not have a uh, real clear-cut etiology that's inducing these all of a sudden mutagenic uh, phenomena in different cells and we have no in Western medicine as we both know there no one talks about it they just say well it's occurring but we don't know why but I think that we can open up the dialogue to other perceptual models that would actually be favorable to understanding why certain people all of a sudden get uh, autoimmune disease uh, right. or they get uh, neoplasia. There are certain events that are occurring, or as you and I have talked about, certain energy perturbations that might be actually inducing uh, changes in cytokine activities like IL-1 or IL-6, IL-7 or TNF-alpha that's actually being motivated by other factors that we can't explicate in our Western model. So I think what you're doing is, is actually awesome. Thank you. And we, you know, I'm down there and we've had medical students come down and rotate underneath me. We've had naturopathic students come and rotate underneath me. You know, I, here we are with the MAPS researchers. I can facilitate researchers with Shipibo shamans. You want to put an EEG cap on Ricardo, you know, I can convince him to do it. So you want to study qualitative results of uh, what's going on, you know, I'm there. I can help facilitate this. So that's one way, you know, is to have people come through the experience. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. We need uh, to stop the questions here and make space for the next speaker. When I ask Brian Anderson to come up, please. <laughs>